Before I go to the specifics of the call to ministry, I just wanted to mention one thing from last week. One of your classmates reminded me of that I didn't mention. We were talking about ways to mitigate risk, and particularly in your property, on your facilities. This is an important point. One very important way to do that is just take a walk around the campus looking for safety hazards, looking for the kinds of things where someone could be injured that are an easy fix. Let me give you an example that's very important, and that is if you have play equipment, much as you see the play equipment on the back campus here, the climbing things, the swings and all of that, you want to have that secured, able to be locked up. Because you may not know this, but even if you don't invite people onto your campus, you can still be liable if something wasn't properly cared for. For example, let's say you don't have your play equipment fenced in, a neighborhood child, after hours, uninvited, comes in and plays on that equipment and is injured. You can be sued by that neighbor and you can be successfully sued for not having mitigated that potential risk and danger. And before you, before you cry foul, uh, even the Old Testament, God laid forth a standard very similar to that. You were responsible to put a, a railing around your roof, remember, so that no one could at, be at risk and fall off. So this is actually a biblical principle that is mandated upon us by legal requirements as well. So anyway, just be aware of that. I wanted to mention that. You can take a walk around and mitigate that. You can't mitigate every risk, but you can at least take a first stab at doing that. All right, I want to uh, look today at the call to ministry. The importance of being called to being a pastor or an elder is very significant. Turn to a few passages that highlight this. Turn first not so much to the issue of uh, elder or pastor, but just to the issue of being a spokesperson for God. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah, this is an amazing chapter of denunciation of the false prophets of Jeremiah's time. And he, he has some interesting things to say about these guys. God puts his words in Jeremiah's mouth. And in verse 21, God says, I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. Here are men who are claiming to be God's representatives without God having sent them. And God says, I take that very seriously. Notice verse 32 of the same chapter. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declared the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and their reckless boasting. That, there's the content of their message. But look at the second half of the verse. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. You see this constantly throughout the Old Testament. Turn back to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 7. The duties of the priests, God says, but you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything concerning the altar and inside the veil, and you are to perform service. I am giving you the priesthood as a bestowed service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. In the Old Testament, to enter the priesthood without the divine calling was a dangerous presumption and one that God did not take lightly. It's interesting, even our Lord didn't operate with sort of a self-appointed commission. God made it clear that Christ didn't set himself up. He didn't appoint himself. Instead, he was divinely appointed to that task. You remember his baptism. The whole point of the dove descending and of the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, hear him. The whole point of that demonstration was to say, this man hasn't called himself to this role. He is divinely appointed to it. You see that later in John 12, verses 28 to 30, when this voice speaks again from heaven, the voice of God, affirming Christ to be the one they ought to listen to. God didn't expect the people of Israel to receive his son apart from a divine, a divine sending, a divine approval, divine stamp on this man and his ministry. When you look at the language of the New Testament that refers to those in ministry, it's interesting words. Listen to these words that are used of those in ministry of some kind. And in Hebrews 5, 4, you have the word called. 
In Acts 13.2 and Romans 1.1, you have separated. In John 22.21 and Romans 10.15, you have sent. In Acts 22.28, made. And in Titus 1.5, appointed. All of those words speak of a divine selection and calling. A setting apart unto a specific duty. Even the New Testament illustrations of ministry imply a divine selection. For example, the words herald, ambassador, steward, messenger. All those words speak of someone who has been appointed and officially sent. So that brings up the question, and this is the question that all of you men have to deal with, as, as I had at one point. And that is, what are the necessary elements of a call to ministry how do you know if you've been called? Well, John Newton said that the divine call consisted of three components. Desire, competence, and providence. Calvin put it a little differently. He writes, If one is to be considered a true minister of the church, it is necessary that he consider the objective or external of the church and the secret inner call conscious only to the minister himself. So there's this objective external aspect and there's this secret inner part that's known only to the minister. When you look at the New Testament though, there's a passage that deals with this objectively. We don't have to take Newton's word for it or Calvin's word for it. There's a passage that speaks very directly of four tests of a man's call to ministry. Four tests, and those tests are contained in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Reformers and the Puritans used to refer to these four elements in, under two headings. And you just heard it from Calvin. An internal aspect, an internal call, and an external call. The internal call is subjective, primarily known only within the man, and comes directly from the Spirit of God. The external is objective outside the man, and it's the work of the Spirit confirmed by the church. Both of these elements, listen carefully these guys, both of these elements, the internal and the external, are essential to a divine call. There are a lot of self-appointed men who have themselves assessed whether or not God has called them to ministry. They've relied solely on the internal aspect of the call. And the external aspects of it have not been present. And they have run when they have not been sent, to use the words of Jeremiah. So, I want to look at these four tests in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The first of the four refers to that internal element of the call. And the final three refer to the external element of the call. The first is found in verse 1. And I call it craving. Craving. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. Notice the word aspire and the word desire. Speak, both of these words speak of craving. This isn't mere excitement or enthusiasm. Bridges, in his excellent section on the call to ministry, puts it this way. An inward movement of the Holy Spirit must imply his influence upon the heart. Not indeed manifested by any enthusiastic impulse, but enlightening the heart under a deep impression of the worth of souls. Constraining the soul by the love of Christ to spend and be spent for him. It's not mere excitement. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about craving. And this craving, by the way, let me give you a warning. This craving is often mistaken for the normal Christian's desire to serve God. The normal Christian desire to use one's gift in the body. Every Christian has that. I don't know about the Master Seminary. I'm sure the percentages are very similar to where I went to seminary. I would guess that there were somewhere between 25 and 30% of the men who were there 
who had mistaken, who obviously didn't have some of these elements we're going to talk about today, and who had mistaken a divine call to ministry. They had assumed a divine call to ministry when in reality all that they had was the normal Christian desire to serve God and to use their gifts in the body. So what is this specific desire? How do you differentiate it? Well, it's interesting. In this passage, in verse 1, there are two Greek words used for desire. The word translated aspires is orego. Thayer says this about it. It means to stretch oneself out in order to touch something or grasp something, to reach after or desire something. The other word translated desires is a word you'll recognize, epithumeo. The epithumia, the word for lust, is taken from this Greek verb. It can be translated to set one's heart upon, desire, lust after, crave. This word inherently is neutral. The object of the desire is what makes it either good or evil. But notice what the person is desiring. A lot of people like to stop with the first. If any man aspires to the office, they like to stop there. Oh yeah, I'd like the office. I mean, I'd like the position. I'd like the stuff that comes with it. You know, there are some perks that come with ministry. Not not as many perhaps as the uh, disadvantages, but there are some. No question about it. There are a lot of people in your congregations who would love the opportunity to take their, the best of their hours and spend time studying the Word of God. But notice what he really desires, the second half of the verse. It's a fine work he desires to do. It's not merely the office that this man craves, it's the work. It's the work of ministry. This desire should be what bridges and in that section of his book, calls a considerate desire. What he means by that is a desire that's the result of matured calculation of the cost. And also a disinterested desire. He describes it this way. A disinterested desire. He says, our choice of the service of our Lord and His sanctuary should be uninfluenced. Here you go. Here are some reasons not to desire it. Love of literature. Opportunities for indulgent recreation. Professional elevation. Being thought well of in the community. Or among Christian people. Selfish motives of esteem. Do you just like people calling you pastor and being the guy they look to? Respectability. Or worldly comfort. (laughs) You may think that's not possible. It is. Compared to many in your congregation. He says those are all wrong reasons to desire. Those are desires that shouldn't be a part of this. What is it you should desire? What's the craving about? It's about doing the work. It's about being in the word of God. It's about seeing people come to Christ. It's about shepherding people and encouraging them. Spending hours doing that, that's what you ought to be desiring. And that's what constitutes that internal aspect of the call to ministry. If you don't have that sort of desire, that sort of craving for the work of ministry, then you haven't been called. So that's the internal aspect. Let's move to the final three which concern the external aspect of this call to ministry. The first is craving. The second is character. Character. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this is where most time is spent when you come to the issue of an elder. Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3, they lay out the character qualifications for what a man of God should be. What a person who's going to be in the ministry should be. Now notice this is objective in the sense that you're not the one who's deciding if you meet these character qualifications. It's objective in that the church, the elders and the church are saying, yes, this man has this character. 
It's your wife saying, yes, from everything I know about this man, I know him better than anyone else, and he has these character qualifications. Not the perfection of his life, but it's the direction of his life, as John so often reminds us. Men, if you have a secret life of shame, as Paul refers to it, then you are not qualified for ministry. You must objectively meet the character qualifications. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean that you don't struggle with pride, you don't struggle with lust. I'm talking about if you have a lifestyle and a pattern that if people knew, they would say, there's someone whose life is characterized by that, then you are not called to ministry. You don't meet the character qualifications. And there are a list of others here. I, I pick on that one just because that's often where men tend to make excuses for themselves. But notice what he says. An overseer, verse 2, then must be above reproach. There's the overarching character qualification. Literally it means without handles. There's nothing anyone can grab onto and reproach your message or your Christ. And that really is a summary of the qualifications that follow. A one-woman man in both mind and body. If you're not married, that speaks of purity. Temperate, prudent, respectable. We've talked about that word when we talked about organized. Hospitable. We'll skip able to teach and come back to it. Not addicted to wine or, or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. There you go. There are the qualifications. Of course, verse 6 adds, and not a new convert. There are the character qualifications. Again, those don't have to be perfect in your life, but they have to be the pattern of your life, what people know you to be. So, you want to know if you're called to ministry? First of all, check your own heart. Do you have a craving to do the work of ministry? And then the church needs to confirm objectively that you meet the character qualifications. There's a third component of a call to ministry. Craving, character, capacity. Capacity. And there are two of these. Often there's only one pointed out. But frankly, there are two of these in the passage. Two capacities that if you're called to ministry, you will have. And you can't alone decide this. Again, these are part of the objective aspect of the call. The elders and the church affirm that this is true of you. Notice the two capacities you have to have. The first is the obvious one, verse 2, able to teach. If you're going to be a pastor or an elder, if you're called to ministry, then God has given you, without question, the ability to teach. This implies both skill and and the knowledge of the proper teaching of Scripture, the knowledge of the doctrine of Scripture. You can have the skill, but if you don't have some knowledge of the Scripture in which to teach, then you aren't called. It's interesting when Paul tells Timothy the kind of men he's to choose to pour himself into. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, identify those who are faithful, whom you can pour yourself into, who will be able to teach others also. Does he mean by be able to teach others also just that they have good public speaking skills? No. He means they've got the whole package. They've got the content. They've got the character. And they've got the capacity to teach. That's what he's really saying here. Able to teach in the sense of both skill and doctrine. This is something the church has to affirm. I told you, I think, earlier in the semester about my, I won't, give you the entire story again, but about my father-in-law's uh, account of that young seminary student who returned from, from uh, I think, his first semester in seminary, and he, he got back and he started preaching, and the, the, uh, as he got through his message, the lady on the front row started shaking her head. You remember that? Did I tell you that story? And uh, he started shaking his, she started shaking her head, and he kept preaching, and she kept shaking her head side to side, and a few minutes later, she started, this is a true story, as my father-in-law related to me, she started saying, the Lord ain't called you to preach. The Lord ain't called you to preach. 
Well, there's a lot of truth to that. The church is supposed to confirm the capacity of men to teach the scripture. People, ought, people around you ought to say, now there's a man, maybe he's not a John MacArthur. In fact, none of us are that. Maybe he's not one of his seminary professors, but he is gifted to teach. He can explain the word of God clearly where people can understand it, where they're challenged by it, and where they, they want to follow that truth and obey it. There's a second capacity, though, not only able to teach, but also notice verse 4. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Verse 5 gives the reason. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? All semester we've been talking about oversight, talking about managing, overseeing. And Paul says... If you're called to ministry, you not only have a capacity to teach, but you have a capacity to manage, to oversee, whichever word you like. And that's demonstrated in how you lead and direct your home if you're married. And if you're not married, it's demonstrated in how you conduct your affairs. You want to know if you're called to ministry, go home and open your drawers. Look at your checkbook. Look at what the inside of your car looks like. How do you manage your life? If you can't manage your life, how are you going to manage the church of God? That's what Paul's saying, Timothy. Oversight is such an important part of our role, and we've covered that all semester, so I won't belabor the point. You want to know if you're called to ministry? Take a look at your craving. Take a look at your character. Take a look at your capacity, able to teach and able to manage. Finally, confirmation. Confirmation. And I've touched on this several times already, but I want to see it as a separate point. Confirmation. Notice chapter 3, verse 10. In the same passage, as he gets to talking about the deacons, he makes an interesting statement. He says, these men, that is the deacons must also first be tested. There has to be an external confirmation on the part of the church that this man has the character and the capacity and the craving. Now, this, this confirmation of the church really has three components. When you look at confirmation, you're really talking about three things. First of all, you're talking about selection. The church sets this person aside. They recognize this person has the potential for this role in the church. You see this even in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul tells Titus to appoint elders in every church. There's a sort of selection process that goes on, and that's a little different in every church, but there is a process, even if it's informal. A sort of recognition, a, a setting aside of those who seem to have that capacity. The second part of this confirmation is evaluation. Evaluation. I mentioned verse 10. It's interesting because this falls, this section falls within a section of Timothy that isn't addressed just to the elders of the church, but that is addressed to the whole church. Most would agree, starting with chapter 2, verse 1, and there's a little disagreement about where the section ends. Some see it all the way through chapter 3. But this section of the book is intended not merely for Timothy, but for the whole church. So in other words, it's the whole church's responsibility to confirm, to evaluate this person, and to say, yes, we agree with, with what others have found. He has these components as a part of his life. He has the craving. He has the character. He has the capacity. We've evaluated that and we confirm it. Here at Grace Church, we do that in two different ways, depending on whether the man is going to be ordained in a ministry or whether he's going to be a lay elder. If he's going to be a lay elder, then once the elders conclude that we want to move him to that status, we post their names on the campus. And for a period of a month, the members can take a look at that and if any of them have concerns about whether or not that man meets the qualifications, they can raise that with the elders and we take a, another look at it. 
Also, for the man who's going to be ordained, that happens through the process of ordination with the elders. And, frankly, members in the congregation can bring up issues as well if they, if they're, uh, if they have them, if they're concerned about some issues in the man's life. And then the final phase, now in confirmation, this fourth aspect of call to ministry, there's selection, there's evaluation, and the third element of confirmation is recognition. You see this in several places. Look over at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. The laying on of hands. The sort of public recognition. That's what it is. That ceremony of laying on of hands in front of the people says, I as an elder have evaluated this man to a degree that I'm comfortable saying he is called to ministry and I'm recognizing that before all of you people. Same thing occurs in chapter 5, verse 22. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. He's saying, look, when you lay hands on, you are essentially saying, we have tested this man, we've evaluated him, and we approve him. That he is in fact, we are recognizing that he's called to this ministry. That he meets all of these other aspects of a call to ministry. So men, if you want to know if you're called to ministry, take a look at your desire. Do you desire to do the work of ministry? Is that what you really want? You desire to sit for hours in your study and deal with the Word of God in a way to understand it yourself and apply it to your own life so that you can then take the overflow of that and declare it to your people. To meet individually with and shepherd people who are going through difficulty. To go after the sheep who strayed, who's gotten caught up in some cult or some other issue and to bring them back to the fold. To love the people under your charge, to, to feed them, to protect them. Do you have the right character? Do you really meet the qualifications? Do you have a life that's free from reproach? Do you have the capacity? Are you able to teach and do others confirm that? Do you have the ability to manage your own household in a way that shows you'll be able to manage and oversee the household of God? And do you have the confirmation of those who know you, the church in which you're a part, saying, yes, we believe that this man has these things and is truly called to ministry. It's not just the internal. It's not just that you have a desire. It's the external as well. And the two mix together to determine whether or not a man is called to ministry. But the beauty of this, men, is if these things are true, you are called. God's not going to write it in the sky. You're not going to get a message, a telegram. You're not going to get some deep gut feeling. This is how you know, right here. Here it is, Paul lays it out. You meet these four elements of a call. If these are true of you, then you're called to ministry. And you can, you can do that gladly and with great freedom, knowing that God has laid His hand upon you. It's not only subjective, which is where most men sort of linger. You know, am I called? Well, here it is. If these things are true, you're called. And proceed with confidence. And do the work of ministry. Yes, sir. Can you repeat uh, under, under confirmation of the church, the first one? Selection. Titus 1.5 is a passage you can look at pertaining to that. The question was, what's the first point under confirmation? Selection. Let me finish uh, before we go on to something a little different here in the short time that remains. Let me finish with a quote from Bridges that sort of sums this whole thing up for me. You ought to get this section from his book, by the way, and put it in your file under Call to Ministry. He recounts the, the late Dr. Leland, and he quotes him at length. Let me read it to you. Listen carefully. God has been graciously pleased to give me some talents which seem capable of being improved to the edification of the church. 
He has disposed and inclined my heart to a willingness to take upon me the sacred ministry. And that not from worldly carnal ends and views, but from a sincere intention and desire of employing the talents he has given me in promoting the salvation of souls and serving the interests of truth, piety, and righteousness in the world. And I have been encouraged by the judgment and approbation of several learned and pious ministers who after a diligent course of trials carried on for a considerable time judged me to be properly qualified for that sacred office and animated me to undertake it. In that paragraph you have all the components we've talked about this afternoon from 1 Timothy 3. And then notice how he finishes. Listen to this. Upon seriously weighing all these things I cannot but think I have a clear call to the work of the ministry. And I verily believe that if I rejected it, I should sin against God, grieve many of his people, counteract the designs of divine providence toward me, and alienate the talents he has given me to other purposes than those for which they seem to have been intended. If these things are true, then you're called to ministry and you shouldn't do anything else. If these things aren't true, then you're not. And you need to face up to that honestly and deal with that even over the summer in your own heart. I hope this afternoon, my goal has not been to discourage any of you, but rather just to encourage you, take an honest look. And I hope for most of you, it's been a great encouragement. As you've looked at your own life and seen these things are true, hopefully it will, as it did for me when I first really discovered this passage, confirm your call to ministry. And you can do it with joy. Even over the summer, you can be confident that God has called you to serve in his church in this way.